Hi everyone. Uh, we have another recording for Voices of Calm for you today and we're going to bring you a reading from a classic piece of Australian literature called Coming Home to Billabong by Mary Grant Bruce. Uh, there are a range of us here today and maybe we could go around and introduce ourselves. So I'm Sarah Backhaller and this is my daughter Lucy who's going to be participating. Um, I don't know which order we can go in but someone can jump in. Okay, I'm Dennis Daly from far away in Perth. Uh, all my collaborators uh, are on the East Coast, so I'll hand over to somebody else. I'm Liz Blackett and I'm uh, over on the Sunshine Coast on the East side, yep. I'm David Prickett and I'm hiding out in uh, Mungie, New South Wales at the moment. <laughs> and I'm Elizabeth Chambers, also hiding out near Mungie. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And we're in Melbourne. so. Uh... Let's get things underway. Okay. Did you just, want to say something else, Dennis? Yeah, j just uh, giving details of the casting. Sarah will be the narrator. Lucy will be Nora. I'll be playing the roles of Dr. Anderson and Mr. Linton. David will be playing the role of Jim. Elizabeth Chambers will be playing the role of Wally. And Elizabeth Blackett will be playing the role of Cecil. So it's over okay. to you, Sarah. All right. Coming Home to Billabong by Mary Grant Bruce, part one. The top of my desire is just to meet a mate of mine, Henry Lawson. It had suddenly become hot, truly Christmas weather, Nora called it, as she stood waiting on the Kanji platform for a train which, in accordance with all railway traditions at Christmas, was already over an hour late. Nora felt it hard that today, of all days in the year, it should be so when Jim was actually coming home for good. At the thought of Jim's arrival, she hopped cheerfully on one leg, completely oblivious of onlookers, and looked up the shining line of rails for the thousand and first time. Would the old train never come? Nora heard a friendly voice behind her. Are you contriving to keep warm with the mercury trying to break the thermometer? Or do you dance merely because you feel like it? Nora turned with a little flush of pleasure to greet the Kanji doctor. She and Dr Anderson respected each other very highly. Because I feel like it, I expect. She laughed, and the two shook hands. Which my wide professional experience leads me to diagnose as the fact that you are probably waiting for Jim. There's a certain hectic flush and intermittent pulse which convinces me of your painful state when coupled with the restlessness of the eye. Which eye? Both. Don't be flippant with your medical man. So he's really coming, Nora? Yes, and I don't care if I'm excited. So you be, Doctor. Billy's outside with the horses, and he's just as excited as I am. Billy? But he'd never more say more than plenty, no matter how excited he was. No, of course not. But he just finds it such a useful word. Nora said a little vaguely. She was peering up the rails. Suddenly, she spun round, her face glowing. There's the smoke. She's coming. Whatever additional remarks Dr Anderson may have made fell on deaf ears, for Nora had no further ideas from that moment. The train came into view over the brow of the hill and slid down the long slope into the station, pulling up with a mighty grinding of brakes. Almost as soon as it stopped, a door was flung open violently and a very tall boy with the grammar school colours on his hat jumped out, cast a hurried glance around and then seized the small person in blue linen in an unashamed bear's hug. Oh, Jimmy, oh, Jimmy boy. Well, old kitty, you all right? My word, I am glad to see you. Me too. It's been such ages, Jim. Hasn't it? Oh, by Jove, there's someone else here. Nora wheeled round and uttered a little cry of joy. Another boy with the dark blue hat band was grinning at her in most friendly fashion. A thin, brown-faced boy with especially dark, merry eyes. Nora extended her hands. Wally, but how lovely. I thought you couldn't come. So did I, said Wally Meadows, pumping her hands with enthusiasm. I was going home, but my aunt obligingly got measles. I'm awfully sorry for aunt but it's an ill wind that blows nowhere. Old Jim took pity on me and here I am. 
I should think so. We haven't felt a bit complete without you. Dad was saying only this morning how sorry he was you couldn't come. He'll, he'll get such a shock. Oh, it's so lovely to have you two. And isn't it getting like Christmas? I'm so happy. Nora jigged on one foot, regardless of interested faces watching her from the train. Jim patted her on the shoulder. You've grown about a foot. Pretty thin too. Sure you're all right? Nora reassured him, laughing. Well, you look awfully fit if you are thin, doesn't she, Wally? Never saw her look fitter. I'm glad as five bob aren't got the measles. Oh, what a beast I am. But you know what I mean. Jim, this train will go on and we've 50 million things in the carriage. So we have. Jim hurriedly took his hand from Nora's shoulder and dived after his chum into the compartment they had quitted. They emerged laden with suitcases, parcels, rackets, fishing rods, golf sticks and other miscellaneous impedimenta. Catch! Jim tossed a big box into Nora's hands. Chocolate, Jim, you're an angel. Jim dropped his load on the platform with a cheerful disregard of what might break. Always knew that. Come on, Wally. We'll get the heavy things out of the van. You watch those, Nor. Who's in, by the way? And where's Dad? Dad's in Kanji, but he had business and he couldn't wait at the station. The train was so late. Cecil's with him. They're both riding. I've got the light buggy with the ponies for you and Billy's driving the express for the luggage and heaps of things that Brownie wants for the house. Nora spoke in one breath and finished with a gasp. Guess people must have thought you were a circus procession. All right, we'll cart the things out to Billy. Out of the big express wagon drawn by a pair of greys, Billy stood, welcoming them with a smile on his countenance that Wally likened to a slit in a coconut. The luggage was piled in with special injunctions to the boy not to put the bags of flour on anything that looked delicate, whereat Billy's smile widened to a grin and he mumbled in delight. That's the lot. The buggy's at the hotel, I suppose, Nora. Yes, and we've... And we're to have lunch with Dad, and you've got to be awfully polite to Cecil. Cecil? If anything's like what he used to be. Wally grinned. Do we get to play with Cecil? The question is, would Cecil want to play with you? He thinks me too much of a kid to look at. Jim's resentment was obvious. Oh, does he? But you both even, you both ever so much bigger than he is, so per, perhaps he'll let you love him. I'm relieved to my soul. Visions of my unrequited affection poured out on Cecil have been troubling my rest for days. May I kiss him? I'd wait a little while. I think I, he may be shy. Not that we've found it or out yet. Indeed, he's the unshyest person I've ever met. Is he very no awful, Nor? Oh, he's a bit of a drawback, Dad says. He's not bad at heart. Only so spoilt that he... that he... And he's terribly bumptious, Jim, and he thinks he can do everything. And his clothes are lovely. He isn't caring for me a bit today, because he gave me a broad hint that he wanted to ride Bob's, and I didn't take it. Ride Bob's? Well, I should think you didn't. Well, I felt rather a pig, considering he's our guest. If... If you, you are Wally now, but he's really got an awful seat, Jim. And Murty says he's a hand like a ham in a horse's mouth. I didn't feel I could let him have Bob's. Bob's is your very special property. No one but an ass would ask for him. And I told Cecil last year you were the only person who ever rode him. Surely there are enough horses on the place without him wanting to collar your pony. Well, he didn't get him, so that's all right. He, you needn't worry, Jimmy. I do think if, 
if one could get him off his high horse, he wouldn't be at all bad. Perhaps he'll loosen up now that you two boys are here. I hope he will for his own sake, because he had such much better time. Well, if he's going to be patronising... Nora glanced lovingly at her tall brother. Ah, per perhaps he won't. I don't believe he could try to patronise you. You're nearly as big as Dad, Jimmy, aren't you? And Wally's going to be too. Ill weeds grow apace. Jim's a splendid example of that proverb. How, how about yourself? Wally replied modestly. I'm coming up as a flower. A Christmas lily, I should think. Jim murmured something that sounded like... More like an artichoke. His exact remark, however, was lost. For at that moment, they arrived at the hotel, just as Mr Linton emerged from it, and Jim quickened his pace, his face alight. Dad! Well, my boy. They gripped hands, and David Linton's eyes lit up as they dwelt on the big fellow. Glad to have you back, old son. Why, Wally? Mr Linton pumped Wally's hand vigorously. Turned up like a bad penny, sir. Hope you'll forgive me. It's pretty cool to arrive without an invitation. <laughs> Far as I know, you had invitations from all the family. We regard you as one of the oldest inhabitants now, you know. At any rate, I'm delighted to see you. The mistress of Billabong must answer for herself, but she doesn't look cast down. She's been fairly polite. On the whole, I don't feel as shy as I was afraid of feeling. I was horribly scared of having Christmas with my aunt, but she's chosen measles instead, so I expect she was just as scared as I was. <laughs> it's probable. You haven't grown up a bit. Wally, and it's such a comfort. I'm getting old and reverent, and it's up to you to treat me with respect, young Nora. Sixteen's an awful age to support with any cheerfulness. His brown face at the moment gave the impression of never having been serious during the sixteen years he lamented. As for this ancient mariner... He waved at Jim. You can see the signs of senile decay quite plainly. Ass. How are you, Cecil? Cecil, coming out of the hotel, a dapper figure beside the two tall schoolboys, gave languid greetings. He cast at Jim a glance of something like envy. Height was the one thing he longed for, and it seemed to him hard that this 17-year-old youngster should be rapidly approaching six feet, while he, three years older, had stopped short six inches under that measurement. However, generally speaking, Cecil was uncommonly well satisfied with himself, and not even the contemplation of Jim's superior inches could worry him for long. He asked polite questions about the journey, with the superiority of the travelled man, and laughed at the freely expressed opinion that the day was hot. You should go to Sydney if you want to know what heat is. <laughs> Victoria <laughs> really has no heat to speak of. Well, I'm a Queenslander, and we're supposed to know about heat there. And I do think today is beastly hot. Look at my collar. It's like a concertina. Sydney is hot. Sydney heat is hot, and Brisbane heat is hotter. But Victorian heat has a hotness all of its own. Everybody laughed, and the discussion was adjourned for lunch. And that's the end of our excerpt from Coming Home to Billabong, part one. Thank you for listening, everybody, and check out for part two, which will be coming up fairly shortly.